Welcome everyone to the Facing Our Fears uh, Zoom workshop webinar. Um, welcome on this very lovely October day. Um, we thought this would be a great time to do this webinar, what with it being the spooky season and all, um, a fun way to celebrate Halloween, all the other major holidays that are around this time of year um, and honoring kind of fear and how that shows up in our lives. So very excited that you all took time out of your day to come and give yourself some space to reflect on fear, its role in your life. Uh, my name is Jen Loxog and I am the Assistant Director of LiveWell. LiveWell is a part of student life on the UW Seattle campus. And we are a compilation of health promotion, health education, um, and early intervention services. We serve um, pretty much all students on the UW Seattle um, campus, and we also serve staff and faculty with some of our services. Um, so I will talk a little bit more about that. Um, what is LiveWell? Um, so I already kind of gave you all a spiel, but this is kind of a you know, visual depiction. Um, we have um, our peer health education program for the campus is a part of LiveWell, and we have 14 paid student employees who go through significant training to be able to offer 12 different types of workshops on a variety of health and wellness topics from sexual assault to healthy relationships to substance use to bystander intervention. Um, and we also have a few of our fees go through additional training to be peer wellness coaches. Um, our staff services that we offer to students include, um, we have AOD consultations and recovery supports um, for students that are interested in learning harm reduction skills or may, they're maybe concerned about their use or someone else's use around alcohol or another substance. They can meet with our AOD coordinator um, and just have a you know, non-judgmental space to kind of reflect on what their use is, how it's impacting maybe athletics, academics, um, their social relationships, um, get connected to other forms of support they might need. Um, our SIP program is a suicide intervention program. Um, we get referrals from Safe Campus and other um, folks on campus that might be concerned about a student and suicidality, and we do an outreach to that student. Um, if they are indeed struggling with suicidality, we can get them fast-tracked into the University Counseling Center and get them other supports they might need for safety, stability, and keeping them enrolled and engaged in school. Um, and then our student care program, also a staff service that's provided to students. Um, it's essentially a first stop um, when something is getting in the way of your academic or um, social well-being here at UW. So if you, you know, had a family death or um, if you're struggling um, with classes um, due to disability, life circumstance, um, maybe you need to do a hardship withdrawal or figure out how to navigate other campus resources. It's kind of like an old fashioned telephone operator. Like here's what I'm struggling with, what resources are available to me, what can help me. Um, that's what student care is. It's like a really great starting place for students. Um, and then confidential advocacy is the one service we have in LiveWell that is um, also for staff and faculty. Um, so since I know we have staff and faculty here, um, uh, our, we have the two advocates for UW Seattle students, but our two advocates also serve all staff and faculty across all three campuses of the University of Washington. And confidential advocates are professional staff members, um, and they are um, the confidential source um, where if someone is experiencing stalking, relationship violence, sexual assault, sexual harassment, um, a confidential advocate is in theory and ideally, it's the best place to go um, because confidential advocates are trained on making sure you understand what your rights are, understanding um, what resources are available to you, helping you get connected um, to resources and supports um, related to workplace and um, academic um, and housing like safety. Um, so we highly recommend confidential advocates if you or someone you know um, in our UW community is impacted by a Title IX related issue. Um, confidential advocates are not a part of Title IX. They are a separate resource for a very important resource a reason, which again is that they are confidential. Um, talking to an advocate is not making a report to the university. It's not making a report to police. Um, confidential advocates are really um, truly confidential um, and not most people on campus are not true confidential um, report sources. Um, they usually have mandated reporting rules or they have to report to someone when a Title IX issue is disclosed to them. And so confidential advocates um, are a legally protected resource for survivors and that they are confidential and they um, are that really important first stop um, for a survivor deciding what they wanna do about a situation. 
Um, and then we also have electronic tools on our website, like e-checkup for alcohol and cannabis that anyone can take um, to kind of check in about their use, get some tips. Um, it's self-paced, confidential, all online, really easy to use. Um, and we are located at 109 Elm Hall. That's our website. You can also scan the QR code. Um, but we do a lot of different fun health promotion pieces throughout the year, um, trying to get people engaged um, in taking care of their health and well-being and building skills to manage the challenges and adversities that come with being a human in life. Um, you can see some of this. We did dental health, um, holistic dental um, awareness last week. And you know, one of these is for our peer wellness coaching. And then the Husky Gratitude Challenge is coming up in November. This will be our fourth annual year of doing that. Um, so more than welcome to head to our website and um, look for more information about that. So intro into Live Well. Um, oh wait, I don't want you to do that yet. Um, so <laughs> it's, uh, I guess I should give you a little bit of intro about me. I'm the assistant director here at Live Well. So a lot of my role is overseeing our um, campus health promotion efforts here at UW Seattle, running our peer health education program, our peer wellness coaches, um, and then also um, helping with our Live Well services overall. Um, my background is actually, I'm a licensed therapist and I actually um, did clinical practice um, for many, many years before um, I moved into the education and promotion um, role, which works out perfectly. Um, that content knowledge is very useful in this um, fun job I get to do, you know, teaching students how to go out and teach each other about health and wellness issues um, and reducing risk when it comes to things like substance use or sex. Um, so uh, that is a little bit of my background. It was on the website, um, but I say that to inform um, this workshop about fear um, is pulling from a bunch of different modalities that are part of my um, clinical training and expertise. It's not a one specific thing. I'm not going to give you like, here's, you know, A, B, C, D that comes from this place. It's a real, it's a, it's kind of a mashup of a lot of different types of modalities that not only come from, um, you know, the world of psychology and clinical counseling, but also come from many other spiritual and religious practices all over the world. Um, so my specialty in when I was clinically practicing was working with complex post-traumatic stress disorder um, and working with um, generational trauma, adult survivors of child abuse. And so um, it's really important when we look at, um, right, like the core of that is like, how do we overcome um, very, very difficult things that have happened to us. How do we overcome adversity? How do we grow through that? Um, and there's a lot of different ways that we can look at healing and look at resiliency. And so I think it's just really important to always be learning. Um, so that was one of my kind of intros. Um, a few housekeeping things before we get started. Um, so tech-wise, um, please just make sure you're um, cameras are on or off, whatever you choose, um, but that you're muted. Um, Lauren from The Whole You, our lovely, awesome collaborator, um, she will be monitoring the chat. Um, I'll take questions at the end, um, but feel free to put questions in the chat and um, she'll track those and we can I can respond to those at the end. Um, we will not be doing breakout rooms. I know as soon as people do breakout rooms, the attendance at something just like drops, uh, <laughs> which is fine. Um, so we will do a bunch, you know, I love to do interactive teaching. Um, so this Zoom format, I'm still getting used to. So, you know, I asked for a little bit of grace, but I will want you to do some self-reflection pieces. So please like have something you can write on nearby, grab a pen, a piece of paper, um, because I will have you do some self-reflection pieces. And then for sharing, again, we won't do breakout rooms. <laughs> um, what we will do is the waterfall style method. Um, so I don't know if some of y'all have experienced this, but what I'll do is I'll say, okay, um, you all had some time to reflect. Everyone with a winter birthday is going to put, an, put something into chat. And then on the count of three, um, I'll say enter and you all are gonna enter it at the same time. So it comes out like a beautiful little waterfall in chat um, where people's um, replies are showing up and we can kind of see a diversity of responses. Um, I think those are the main things. Um, there is no trigger warning for this presentation. Um, trigger warnings do not work. Um, there finally have been meta studies to validate what I've been saying for many years, <laughs> um, which is that they do not work and they actually can be harmful. Um, so that's also my little PSA. If you wanna read the research about it, 
I'm happy to send it to you, send me an email. Um, but also there's nothing graphic in this workshop at all. Um, we're gonna be talking about fear and um, how we manage fear in our lives. So hopefully everyone has something to write on because um, as you probably saw on my first slide, um, that is gonna be our first prompt. So I'm gonna give you all about 90 seconds. I want you to write down and think about three things that you've done in the past few years that you are really proud of or that brought you a lot of joy. Okay, so as you write down those three things, I'm gonna guess that brings back hopefully some memories of the journey of whatever those things are that you wrote down. Um, I am gonna have everyone with a spring birthday. Um, put one of those things in chat that you feel comfortable sharing and um, I'll give you a minute to type it and then we're gonna do our first waterfall, so. Everyone with a spring birthday and anyone who wants to also join, <laughs> but just so we don't have like 80 replies at once. Um, all right, on the count of three, everyone with a spring birthday, press enter. So one, two, three. Oh, beautiful. Okay. Maybe we don't have a lot of spring birthdays, but thank you all for those who've done it. Um, yeah, adopting cats, retiring, um, changing our um, habits related to food and movement. Beautiful. Um, so the reason that I have you all start off by reflecting on those things is, um, you know, if we were in a Zoom room, I'd have you tell me why I had you do it, but since, you know, we're on Zoom, um, is maybe, common sense, but it is worth reiterating really directly is that um, those things that we are proud of, those things that brought us joy, um, probably took a lot of effort. And at some point, if not through most of our journey and maybe completing, achieving, working on those things, building those things, um, we probably experienced fear. And that's because fear shows up in things that are really important to us. And some of the most important parts of our life are inextricably linked to experiences of fear. Um, so it's really to just start us all off on this foundation of that the things that we love and value most in our life, we cannot separate from these experiences of fear. Um, experiencing fear is a part of those really meaningful, fulfilling parts of our life. All right. So fear, it's a normal experience for us as humans. Um, it is not abnormal. It's not pathological. Fear is a very normal experience for us. And for a good reason, it keeps us safe, um, right? There's a lot of different theories in evolutional studies, psychology, um, sociology about, you know, the origins of fear and what it serves, it's, you know, how it serves us in multiple different ways. Um, but we know that fear is really important. It keeps us safe. It lets us know when something isn't going well, when something isn't right. Um, and if we didn't have fear, that wouldn't, would not be so good. Um, and so using that perspective to remember that fear is not objectively bad. A lot of times, especially in times when we're experiencing a lot of fear, we can get into this negative connotation or perspective of fear and be like, fear is really bad. Fear's like really frustrating. Um, like I don't want to feel fear rather than being able to step back and appreciate that, um, like, yes, there are skills we can use to try to mitigate the effects of fear being a barrier, which we're gonna talk about. Um, and part of that is also appreciating that fear does help us. 
Um, it is a teacher, it right like tells us when something isn't right. Um, and that comes in many different forms. Um, fear is not the same as a phobia. Um, and so just to like clear that up too, um, you know, we're not talking about um, like pathological um, levels of things, not talking about essentially diagnostic levels um, of fear. Um, in, you know, the current time period, a lot of times um, diagnostic language that gets used in the field um, enters into our everyday conversations. Um, and as an educator and as someone with a clinical background, um, I'm pretty, you know, pretty, uh, what's that word? Um, pretty, well, I, it's important to me, especially in teaching my students um, for facilitation wise, that we stay away from diagnostic language and we use the language that actually says what we're feeling. Because sometimes we do that too. We use like diagnostic language instead of actually saying the emotion. Um, and it's really important to be able to build our emotional vocabulary. And that is why we are talking about fear specifically. Um, and we're not talking about, again, like fear that rises to the level where it's impacting our dysfunction to a significant degree, like a phobia um, or other um, types of, you know, diagnostic level um, conditions. So just to put that out there, um, fear is a mixture of bodily responses. Um, fear is not just up here. Sometimes we get stuck in thinking of like from here up um, and we're like, oh, but I'm like having these thoughts and that's fear. Um, and thoughts are a part of our fear experience, but it is a whole body physiological experience. And then last one, again, a reminder of perspective. Fear can become pleasure. So fear is not just adrenaline and cortisol. It also can be tied to dopamine. And a great example is roller coasters or haunted houses. Um, things that we do where fear um, actually leads and is like combined with the dopamine release. Um, and that kind of speaks to also fear just being a part of the learning experience, right? Like we, when things are new, they can be scary and we can feel fear um, and a lot of times we want novelty as humans. Um, novelty is a part of how we continue to learn and grow. And so um, just again, that perspective piece of like fear is a very complex thing in our life. Um, it's not objectively bad or good. Um, it's more nuanced, just like us as people. Um, so, and then you can see my fun little graphic of someone learning how to surf, which is just a fun reminder of, right? Like anytime we do something new, fear shows up. Um, and then right like at the end, the little person is smiling. Um, all right, so what is fear? All right, this is gonna be, um, again, a take 40 seconds and write down like, what does fear show up as for you? What's it feel like in the body? What are the thoughts? Like, how do you define fear? And everyone with a summer birthday, put a part of your definition, your reflection into chat. And then when I say go, then we'll, we'll do waterfall. So summer birthday folks. All right. And go. Uncertainty freezing, clenching in the chest, increased heart rate, feeling stuck. Yeah, feeling a heaviness in the chest, uncertainty. Beautiful, yeah, jaw clenching. Yeah, awesome responses. So in all your responses um, are reflecting the fact that fear is a physiological experience in our bodies. Um, so it's not just in our mind, again, like I said, like it is a combination. And so come, you know, there's a lot of different ways that we define fear um, that can also be very context specific, but a good kind of overall definition is a physiological experience um, related to an actual or perceived threat, danger, pain, loss, or negative evaluation. Um, so again, not just actual, right, perceived. And I think a lot of us can think about how like fear shows up 
you know, when we actually maybe are in danger or are experiencing pain, and that usually makes a lot of sense to us, but even if we perceive it, right, so negative evaluation is a great one, or um, we perceive that a loss might happen, um, right, like those things also create that physiological response. Um, so, and at the bottom, oh, crap, ah, sorry, <laughs> still getting used to Zoom formatting. Um, so at the bottom, right, so fear is a combination of the physical sensations in our body, right? So fear gears up our central nervous system um, to react into essentially what we talk about as like fight or flight. Um, and right, like hormonally things start to change in our body, blood flow changes, our heart rate goes up. Um, there are like physical things happening in our body when we experience fear. And those physio like physical responses are on a spectrum, right? Um, based on kind of what's happening. And so sometimes we might have this like low grade level of like having that part of our central nervous system, fight or flight activated because we might have like a chronic stressor or something that's causing us fear. Um, or it can be right like zero to 60, right? Like if you accidentally go to step into the street and you like your body, your body usually sees it before you even cognizantly recognize like, oh, there's a car and you step back, right? Um, so the physical sensations, like our bodies are working even quicker than our mind is, um, which is why it's so important to understand that aspect and understand the central nervous system um, is what is kicking things up. And then we also get the cognitive portion of thoughts, right? Like we have thoughts of like, I don't want to fail this test or performance evaluation. Um, I do not want like my boss or partner to think negatively about me when they find this out. Um, and those thoughts, those are usually the things that we tend to be a little bit more keyed into unless you already have a high level of body awareness. Um, so that's, you know, a good point to reflect on is like when you experience fear, um, how, how connected are you to where it starts? Um, does it only connect for you when you start having thoughts connected to it? Or do you start to feel it in your body first? Um, and it might change based on what the source of the fear is too. Um, and then emotions. Emotions are a fascinating thing that we are still learning so much about in research um, because they're a combination of thoughts and physical sensations. Um, they're a combination of like our limbic system in the brain, right? Like when the amygdala senses fear, it shuts down our cerebral cortex, which is responsible for like rational thought, um, which is why, right, the limbic system is a part of the central nervous system. Um, when our nervous system, again, kind of goes into that fight or flight, ramps up in response to fear, um, it's impairing the part of our brain that allows us to like think through something, um, which is why we tend to get pretty reactive when we're scared, um, because we aren't having that part of our brain that has evolved much later than the amygdala um, that is like, oh, but that's not real, or you have these other things that will mitigate this, or right, all those kind of rational, helpful thoughts. Um, and again, so emotions are, again, we're still learning so much about them, but they're usually the words that we tend to label, um, like both thoughts and feelings. Um, and so, yes, that's all I'm going to say about that. And then behaviors. Um, sometimes people forget this one of that when we are scared or experiencing another type of, especially difficult emotion, um, we tend to get into behavioral patterns that we use in response to it. Um, and so this is a great one to just reflect on of like, are there behavioral habits you've gotten into in response to fear? Um, you know, like how, how, what's your kind of default setting of when you get really scared, what do you do? Um, so I'm going to give you actually like 15 seconds to just think about that. Are there default behavioral patterns that you've gotten into when you feel scared? Again, it's a good thing to reflect on. I'm not going to have you all waterfall that one. Um, so what do we have fear about? Lots of things. So there's lots of different theories out there, lots of different ways that psychologists and historians and sociologists have characterized fear and trying to talk about the universal experience of fear in the human experience across the earth. Um, these are the categories I have made, um, and they are pretty self-explanatory. What I would like you to do is to pull out that pen and paper, and I want you to go through and come up with a personal example of in each of these categories. 
So what is like one specific type of fear that shows up around your sense of self or identity that shows up on a pretty regular basis for you? Um, what's one that shows up in your, um, the category of other, right? Like loved ones, social perceptions, um, and then also for life and death mortality. Um, so thinking about those. So, um, you know, I'll give some examples. So a self, a fear that commonly shows up for me um, that actually fits in two categories is, right? Like my sense of self, I very much am a learner and I love to teach. And so one of my fears is what will happen as I age, not just because aging can be scary, so that that's in the life and death category, but also because it will change how my brain functions and how my verbal skills and my like intellectual quickness, it's going to change those things as I age. And those are things that I use to define my sense of self. They're things that I value about who I am in the world. And so that's a fear I have that fits into like, how I view myself and my place in the world. And then also obviously fits into that mortality category. Um, and then, you know, a common fear for others. Um, I think a loved one, I just had a baby a few months ago um, and definitely the fears of becoming a parent and not being able to know what the future is gonna hold for my little one. Um, the fear about what, you know, what will their life be like, so. I'll give you all a little more time to reflect on again a specific one for you in each category. All right, this one I'm not going to do a specific month. Um, how about anyone with a vowel in their name, in your whole name? <laughs> um, anyone who feels comfortable, if you um, would put into chat one of the things that you wrote down. Um, and then when I say go, we'll do waterfall. So I'll give you a minute to type it out. The thing I love about this waterfall before we do it is that it helps normalize that we all are experiencing fear. It's a part of being alive. It's like, it's kind of like the cost of the gift of life is that, right, there's always, you know, in our lives, there's a lot of things we care about. Um, and that means there's also things that we're going to fear loss of or change. So, um, all right. So everyone who's typed into chat, go waterfall it up. Oh, love it. Look at all those very real fears. Yeah, financial resources, social perception, mortality. Yeah, our sense of legacy or being forgotten. Oh, flying, yes. Yeah, being asked to do something we don't know how to do. Health, access to resources. Yes, all of those are very true and very real fears. Um, and there are fears that it's not like there's something easy we can do to just change that, right? There are fears that we live with. All right. So related to that, before we kind of hop into what we do with those fears, um, what are the unhelpful ways we react to fear? So again, think about yourself. What are the unhelpful things that maybe you do when you feel fear? Um, just build some of that self-awareness. How about everyone with a autumn birthday, type something into chat about an unhelpful way we as people, you, people around you react to fear. And waterfall on one, two, three. Nice. Avoidance, shutting down, hyper-focus, tunnel vision, avoidance of trying new things. Yeah, substance use, fleeing the situation. Yeah, all of those are very unhelpful ways we, re we react to fear. And notice how I, I call it unhelpful, right? Um, we can get in the habit of just saying like, oh, I did this thing and it was bad. And if that works for you, it works for you. Language is really subjective. It's meant to 
help us communicate. So if that if those work for you, that works for you. Um, I know for me, it has been more helpful. And for a lot of the people I've worked with in my life, it's been unhelpful to just label it or it's been more helpful to label it as unhelpful rather than bad because it allows some space for some compassion of like, we did this thing and like, yes, maybe I coped with my stress last night um, by like drinking more alcohol than I should have. Um, or maybe I yelled at my kid when I got really mad or you know, maybe I did this other thing. And rather than beating ourselves up about it being bad, just being able to more objectively say like, it wasn't helpful. It didn't serve us in the long run because that frame of reference still keeps us in the compassionate center of like, we didn't do those things like intentionally. It's usually because we are in that like aroused state of our physiological response to fear and we're not thinking things through. Um, so again, kind of building in some of that compassion. So is, that's what we're gonna kind of talk about more is like, how do we take fear and, tur and turn it from a barrier into a bridge? And here's a lovely bridge in autumn trees um, for those of you who are visual like me, um, right? Like rather than letting fear be something that cuts us off from ourselves, from other people in our lives, from things we wanna do in our life, how do we turn it into a bridge um, and use it in a way that's effective and helps give us insight and teach us about ourselves and other people. Um, so this is a, I know people, a lot of people love like set plans. Um, I'm also very type A, so I liked, I like, you know, a plan. I like numbers. I like lists. <laughs> um, so this is a good way of kind of conceptualizing, like, what do we do with our fear? So the first step because we know that fear activates a physiological response in our body is to regulate. We need to regulate our central nervous system and essentially calm the body down. That way we have the ability to respond to our life, which involves, right, like thinking things through, usually being more intentional about what we're doing rather than just reacting, which tends to be that impulsive response that again is more based in that physiological, like the amygdala is activated and it's like fight, flight, flee, freeze. Um, I know I said one of those twice, but um, yeah, so that's why that is always first. Second, investigate. Use our critical thinking skills, check the facts, um, right? Go to the emotional and cognitive part of it. Second, first part has to be to calm the nervous system so that we can get that cerebral cortex back on board and be able to think things through, which is gonna give us more accurate information about what's going on for us. Three, learn. What can we learn about this fear, about this experience we're having? What um, is it telling us? And that involves using a sense of curiosity rather than judgment. Um, and then fourth, make a decision. Because a lot of times with fear, um, we can get caught in indecision. And that usually actually just makes things worse for us. Um, sometimes it's just about after we go through this process, making the best decision with the information we have and the moment we're in um, and you know accepting what we cannot change changing what we can and both those take courage and we're going to talk about courage as a skill so um, one regulate and calm the body prayer and meditation so prayer and meditation especially when they are regular practices of your life um, are very helpful in calming the central nervous system we know that from research um, you can't just do them though when you get really stressed um, it's like showing up to like play a sport only on game day. Like you gotta, you gotta practice. You gotta practice on good days, bad days, good weather, bad weather. So that when you have a challenge come up, you've had all this building and scaffolding, um, for this skill to serve you well when the stakes are a little bit higher. Um, so prayer and meditation are both, um, and other, you know, other spiritual and religious practices that people have. Um, those um, are often um, very effective at calming the central nervous system. Um, TIP is a fun little acronym. It comes from dialectical behavioral therapy, um, but the science behind it we see in many different um, like emotional regulation um, treatments and skills. We see it in spiritual and religious practices that are much, much older in the history of humanity than the field of psychology. Um, temperature, so especially cold. Um, when your central nervous system is activated using temperature to calm your body. So putting like an ice pack on your face or running your hands under cold water, putting a cold washcloth on your face 
Um, specifically, um, the coolness is really helpful in calming the central nervous system. Intense movement, doing a few jumping jacks, like running in place for like 30 seconds. Um, anything to essentially, right, like when you're in fight or flight, like you have excess adrenaline and cortisol. So letting your body kind of use some of that by just doing something, you know, like, I don't know, hold, hold a plank, do something that works for you and your body. Um, even if it's just like a brisk walk, something to allow your body to move. Um, pace breathing. So there's so many different breathing exercises out there. Um, you can, you know, easily Google breathing exercise and find one that you like squared breathing, box breathing, uh, one, two, three, four breathing. <laughs> there's so many different ones. Um, and again, it works because we know that the nervous system, right. Um, is what's aroused and then progressive muscle relaxation. Also, you can easily Google, um, is a very effective, um, technique. And then grounding, this is just, again, another way grounding skills are essentially using our senses um, to calm the body and bring us back into our body. Because when we um, tend to experience uncomfortable emotions, physical sensations, we tend to go up into our head um, or we just kind of cut off awareness of our body. And so bringing us back into our body by using groundings like, you know, smells that are calming to us, um, touching things that feel solid. That's why I like weighted blankets, people like those, or, you know, if you fear pet or child like falls asleep on you, um, right? Like touch, even like a hug from someone you care about and feel safe with. Um, taste, um, I usually recommend like tea, but also some people have like soothing types of like food, things like that. Um, and then sounds, again, thinking about how you can use your senses to calm your body. Yes, identifying items by sight also, I saw that in the show up in the chat, is also a great grounding technique. Thank you for adding that. Um, two, investigate. So um, these are you know, three different kind of ways of looking at how do we bring some clarity to what's having con happening cognitively for us around fear. So a lot of times when we have fear, um, we get caught up in cognitive distortions. Um, if y'all have never heard, I'm, this day and age, I think there's lots of things around about cognitive distortions, but if you haven't, um, please, after this, like just Google cognitive distortions and you can easily pull up a list on the internet. Um, and there are so many different ones. Um, I pulled out four just for sake of time and four that tend to show up a lot with the experience of fear. Um, so dichotomous thinking, getting into seeing things as only like two choices or being like this versus this of like, I can only do this or this. We get into like this tunnel vision um, that kind of narrows options. Um, Overgeneralizing, taking one piece of information and then applying it very liberally to everything else. Um, when again, that is, usually not accurate or helpful. Um, jumping to conclusions, pretty self-explanatory. I know we all do this, especially again, like when we're scared, um, there's a lot of like jumping to conclusions, which is why it's important again to calm our body down so we can notice when we've done that cognitively. And then emotional reasoning, that's when we use our emotions to like decide something factual. So it's like, well, if I feel unsafe, then it must be true that I am unsafe. That would be emotional reasoning which is not helpful because we can feel things separate of like the independent facts. So I might feel unsafe. It doesn't mean that I actually am in like danger. And so emotional reasoning is a really important one to watch out for and be like, oh, I feel like this went poorly. But objectively, if I use checking the facts, everyone else responded fine. I don't think that is actually accurate, um, right? Like thinking about what's the veracity of something is a true or false. Um, and accepting the ambiguity is a part of the process. Like we can never know everything about everything. Um, we just have to do the best with like, what is the evidence we have? Like thinking our, our, you know, thinking through our narrative that we've created in our head of like, is this true? Things like that. Um, critical thinking, uh, there's lots of aspects to critical thinking, right? Analysis, um, asking really good questions of usually of ourselves or people around us. But in this case, since we're talking about self-directed um, way of managing fear, like asking yourself really good questions. So like this thing that I'm afraid of, um, like, why am I afraid of that? Why did I have that reaction? What is that fear stemming from? Um, and being careful of like what assumptions we might be making or what interpretations we're using. Okay. Um, this is another way of essentially just building that awareness and investigating a fear. 
um, thinking about um, like, what type of fear is this? Is it a primal fear of like a lot of us, like our, we are built to want to avoid pain. We are built to want to avoid death, um, right? Those are primal fears. They're kind of built into our evolutional existence. Um, a personal fear is more like it's connected to a, like our sense of self identity, right? Like I have a personal, I have a very strong personal value of doing the right thing. And so I have a fear of like, if I do the wrong thing and I don't know about it, um, not being told and having people perceive me, um, right. As like, it's like, it's really important to me that I'm perceived as someone responsible who does the right thing. Um, and so if I did something wrong, like how does that play into my personal sense of like self, but also like evaluation by others. Um, so it kind of connects to that other slide about types of fears. Um, and then rational versus irrational fears. So again, just another way to build our information about our fears, right? Like I have a, um, irrational fear of driving off a bridge, like no reason. I've never had that happen to someone close to me. I've never, it's never happened to me clearly. Um, but I have dreams about it and I'm, every time I have to cross the bridge, like I have a fear of like accidentally driving off a bridge and it's very irrational. And I know that, and it still exists and it doesn't go away. It exists. It's there. Um, versus like a rational fear, um, right? Like we all tend to have some rational fears of where we can point to something and be like, I'm scared of this because of this. I'm scared of getting breast cancer because it runs in my family, right? That's a rational fear. There's a reason that we can point to. Um, and the, the helpfulness of this is that um, it just gives us more data and it helps inform like what we're going to do about it. Um, the irrational fear in particular, I it's a good moment to again practice compassion of like just because it's irrational doesn't mean it's not real you still have that experience of fear it's still a part of your life um and so just also giving yourself that compassion three learning what can you learn by being curious rather than judgmental um, i like to call this the befriending your monsters befriending your shadows um, right, the things that we actually want to try to avoid or push against or the things that we're very quick to be like, I hate feeling fear, I hate feeling anger, whatever those things are that we essentially are trying to push away, either physically or psychologically, learning how to actually bring them close and um, befriend them, have a relationship with them. Um, I kind of frame it as like dating, like getting to know um, our, this, this thing we have a relationship with and we have, we all have a relationship with fear. We can't be alive and not have a relationship with fear. And so getting to know it and using a bunch of different modalities to learn more about it. So just like when you're dating someone or trying to make a new friend, you like can get to know them by having a direct conversation. You can get to know them by watching them in their life. You can get to know them by going to play games with them or like play a sport. Like you have different ways of learning about this very complicated person or thing. And fear is no different. Like we have, we can use a variety of tools to better understand our fear um, because the more we understand it, right? The more we can be patient, compassionate and also make better informed decisions about how we want it to impact us and our decisions. So choice activity. Um, so I'm gonna give you all um, some time and if you are more artistically inclined or want to challenge yourself more artistically, um, the challenge on the left is for you, the, um, the darker background. And if you are someone who just prefers to like journal or make bullet points um, as your way of kind of processing through, um, then you can choose the part on the right with the light background. Um, so we kind of have a choose your own adventure way of building some of that like learning and trying to build some of that sense of curiosity. So I will give you all a little bit of time, but not much because I realize that I am running out of time. <laughs> You'll also get this, uh, these slides uh, or the presentation sent to you afterwards. You can always come back to it. Um, you could also just take a screenshot with your phone um, if you want to come back to this at another time. So um, 
go ahead and keep doing the exercise if you are doing it. Um, and for those of you that feel comfortable um, sharing in chat, um, whether you did one of these in your mind's eye, if you wrote some things out, um, what is like one of the connections you made of like something you have learned maybe in this moment or maybe like recently about one of your fears? Like what's something that that fear, um, you don't have to tell us what the fear is, but what's something that the fear has told you or like taught you about yourself, about your life, about what's important to you? Um, so if those who feel comfortable, oh crap, <laughs> uh, those who feel comfortable can put it in chat. Um, and then when I say one, two, three, we'll do that. So give you a minute to type something in chat. Like what's something you've learned from your fear? And then waterfall on one, two, three. Mm, the importance of learning to let go. Yeah, our sense of control, staying in the present moment. Yeah, spots where we have space to grow still. Yes, fear is a source of personal growth. Oh, trusting others, yeah, beautiful. Yeah, not procrastinating, yeah. So definitely recommend, um, you know, again, take a screenshot of this slide, like come back to it. Um, you know, again, two different ways of kind of doing some exploration and building some of that curiosity of like, what can your fear tell you? What can it teach you? Um, taking that like perspective. Um, and this is just a beautiful quote, I think that really speaks to the idea of um, things that we tend to label as scary or vicious or bad in quotes, right? Um, are really just things that need our love and attention. And that's often what a lot of love is, is attention, right? It's compassionate, patient attention. Um, and so when we feel fear, how do we give it space um, to acknowledge and learn from it and see what it needs? Because sometimes when we're scared, it means that we need something from ourselves or maybe we need something from our environment. Um, but again, that like compassionate space, it's just a beautiful quote and I think image that depicts that. And then four, making a decision. Um, so someone mentioned procrastination. This is great. Calvin and Hobbes comic about um, not doing what Calvin's doing, which is waiting for the last minute panic. <laughs> um, because again, if we do that, then we're just feeding into that physiological response that fear already creates in our body, um, where we write like shut down the parts of our brain that help us think through, through and we just kind of react. Um, so making a decision, deciding like based on calming our body, thinking it through, like keeping an open mind and learning and trying to be curious about what our fear is telling us. Um, what are we going to do with that? What's the attitude we're going to take into holding that fear and managing it? Um, what do we need to accept? Like, what can't we change? Because there are things that we have fear about that we can't change. They are out of our control. Um, and so how do we practice acceptance, which is a continuous practice. It is not a one stop. There's no goal. There's no end. Like acceptance is a process and we continuously have to practice it as long as we are alive. And then action. Like what are the things we can take action about and make changes or do make different choices um, that are in our best interest of kind of what we want to do with that fear, or what we need to do with it. So all of that takes courage. What is courage? So take 15 seconds and think about what is your definition of courage? Um, everyone with a, oh, everyone whose favorite season is autumn, um, put your definition of courage in chat. And think about what is courage? What is it to you? What does it mean? Oh, okay, yeah, waterfall. Three, two, one, or <laughs> I did it backwards. You all already did it though, fantastic. Um, courage, ability to step out of your comfort zone, believing in yourself, um, doing it anyway, even when you feel scared. Yeah, acting in despite of our fear, um, acknowledging fear. Yeah, beautiful definitions, moving forward. Um, yes, courage is, not so much a feeling as it is an action, which a lot of you pointed out in your responses. A lot of times other people will look from the outside at what we're doing and they'll say, you're so brave, you're so courageous. And inside we're like, well, I feel 
I feel really terrified right now. I do not feel brave or courageous. And that's really normal, right? Often other people are just seeing the external part of the action of like we are con we are continuing to move through and persevere and take an action, even though we are scared. Um, and so that's really normal. Like don't, don't expect to feel courageous and brave because if you spend time waiting to feel that way, then you probably are gonna be waiting a long time. Um, courage is not really a feeling. It's more of like the feeling of courage is usually being af afraid. Um, and it's the action piece that usually defines like, okay, what I'm doing is brave because I'm still showing up to this thing that I'm really scared to do, or I'm still gonna have this really difficult conversation with my spouse that I'm really scared to have. Um, and so, right, courage and like how we move through fear um, and that and how we take action still um, usually can come back to some of these things of like our beliefs and our personal values. Like those are things that help us still take action in the face of fear. There are things that we can ground ourselves in when we, we are very scared and be like, okay, and even though I'm really scared, this is really important to me. It's really important to my value that I say this truthful thing, even though it might upset other people, because I value truth and I value speaking the truth. Um, another like related but different way of grounding ourselves in courage is to go back to what the meaningfulness is of it. A lot of the most meaningful things we all do in our lives, um, relationships, um, big moves, big changes, career changes, um, like facing medical issues, like a lot of those things we do because there's meaning and importance to it and centering ourselves in like, what is, what is the meaning of what I'm doing? What is the importance of like where this is taking me that can help us continue to walk through the fear and not get stuck and frozen. Um, and courage really is like that perseverance in the face of risk. Um, so that brings us to this beautiful quote. If anyone has read The Alchemist, you will recognize this. Um, it's a very, very well-known book throughout the world. Um, highly recommend you read it if you haven't. It's one of my favorites. I always have my student employees read it um, and they love it. Um, but essentially it's about not giving in to our fears because if we do, we won't be able to talk to our heart, right? So the root of the word courage, courage comes from core, which is Latin for heart. And the heart, right, in symbolism throughout history and literature, you know, in, across community and culture, the heart is kind of a symbol of like our spiritual, emotional, social center and our like truth. And so thinking about like fear can be a cloud um, and we don't want to give into that cloud, right? We want to like see it, we want to acknowledge it, we want to learn from it. Um, and we still want to look for like, how do we continue to move through? and honor like what is our truth like what is important to us and that's what courage is um so what are four things you can do um or already do that helps strengthen your sense of courage um so i think of this you know thinking about that like slide two slides ago like what are those things that help ground you in your beliefs what's important to you what you find meaningful um, so for me, something I do that inspires and strengthens my sense of courage is um, I really love to read autobiographies and biographies um, of, you know, not just current people, but people throughout the history of time all over the world, um, because I can learn and be inspired by how they have moved through really difficult things in their life. And I can read their stories and write like there's a sense of modeling and learning and also just a sense of like, right, this is part of our experience of being human is moving through really difficult things. Some of them just like, just part of being human and some of them very abnormal parts of being human, um, you know, like war and like, you know, very extreme things. Um, and no matter how extreme the adversity gets, like we have, we have borne these wounds as a human population. And so learning from people in history of like, how have they walked through the world, still being courageous in the face of fear. Um, so thinking about what are those things that you do? What can you do? Um, and then anyone who, this is a great one to just see what other people say, learn from each other. Anyone who feels comfortable, if you can put one or two of those things in chat um, to share with the group. And we will do waterfall method in one, two, three. 
connecting with others. Yeah, affirmations. Yeah, focusing more on the goal or the reason why you're doing something rather than the fear. Yeah, the why, prayer. Yeah, volunteering, yes, altruism um, is a really important protective factor and a source of courage. Beautiful. So to wrap us up, um, I think this is a beautiful poem about fear and courage and risk. Um, and so this is what I will end with is leaving you all to read this poem. Um, The person who risks nothing, does nothing, has nothing, and is nothing. They may avoid suffering and sorrow, but they simply cannot learn, feel, change, grow, love, or live. Risks must be taken because the greatest hazard in life is to risk nothing. Only a person who risks is free. I think that's just a beautiful source of courage and also just validating that fear and risk are a part of life. Um, so... Thank you all so much for coming. Um, if you would like to give me feedback and also if you do scan this QR code, um, you could give me some feedback. Also tell me what types of other types of programs you're interested in seeing um, conducted about health and wellness. Um, also, you'll be automatically entered to win a prize um, by completing the feedback form. And this is just a fun little graphic um, that our peer health educators made that we'll post um, for Halloween next week, but I wanted to share it with you all early. Um, but thank you all so much for coming. Um, Lauren, are there any questions in chat or if people have questions, please feel free to put them in chat. Now I can see the chat too. And I'm happy to answer those for anyone who needs to stick around. Yes, we will send out the recording and I'll send out a PDF of the slides as well. Happy to share those. Yeah, we are out of time. Okay. Um, yes, you will need to sign into a Google account to access the QR code form. Um, please feel free to put any questions that I might have missed in that QR, uh, QR code form, or you can directly email me, LWP, or you can look me up by my name, Jen Moxog, um, in the UW directory and also email me that way. Um, but please send me any other questions you have. Again, thank you all so much for taking the time on your Wednesday and have a lovely rest of your day.